Okay, so in this next video in the playlist on uh, cyclic AMP signaling, what we're going to discuss is uh, the protein kinase C pathway. So this is a pathway that's really important in all of physiology, um, and you know a lot of drugs interact with it. So uh, we're going to study it in its own right, and we're also going to interlink it with a bit of calcium homeostasis and a few drugs here and there that interact. Okay, uh, so uh, what we're going to begin with then is um, a cell membrane, a phospholipid bi there. So here is our phospholipid bi there. And basically, we're going to start with some G protein coupled receptor because the whole of the protein kinase C pathway is basically, uh, basically begins with a G protein coupled receptor, which is a seven transmembrane receptor, meaning that it has seven transmembrane domains, basically. Okay, uh, so uh, some ligand is going to come along for this G protein coupled receptor. And I should stress that, you know, there are absolutely loads of G protein coupled receptors that are going to interact with the protein kinase C pathway. And I'm just going to put that as the title, the protein kinase C pathway. Okay, right. So um, this is, I'm keeping it nice and generic here. So we have our ligand and we have this G protein coupled receptor that is going to be, um, going to basically trigger this protein kinase C pathway. So here is our ligand and here is our uh, G protein coupled receptor. But basically, if you want to make a, have a concrete example in mind, uh, then you can think of the ligand as being acetylcholine, which is often abbreviated ACH, A for acetyl and CH for choline. And you can think of this GPCR as being the muscarinic 1 acetylcholine receptor. Okay, right. So, this G protein coupled receptor is going to be coupled with a G protein, a heterotrimeric G protein. Heterotrimeric G proteins consist of three subunits, an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit. Okay, now, this GPCR, uh, which is going to activate the protein kinase C pathway, is going to be coupled with what is known as a GQ heterotrimeric G protein. So this whole G protein here is going to be GQ. And what that means is that the alpha subunit is going to be a specific one of the 16 possibilities. So when you're building a G protein, there are 16 possibilities for the B alpha subunit that you can use. So alpha has 16 genes all coding for different, slightly different alpha subunits, but they can all function as the alpha subunit in a heterotrimeric G protein. But they all trigger different pathways, basically. Okay, there are five different options for the beta subunit. And as far as the gamma subunit is concerned, there are 12 different options. So there are a huge number of possible heterotrimeric G proteins that you can make. Um, now, if your G protein is GQ, what that means is that this alpha subunit is a specific one of the 16 possibilities. Namely, it is the alpha Q subunit. As far as what the beta and gamma are, we don't know and we don't care, basically. If it's GQ, it means that it has this alpha Q subunit. Right, so when this G protein is in its inactive state, the alpha Q subunit is bound to GDP. Okay, and uh, basically, uh, either the inactive GPCR, i.e. before the ligand is bound to the GPCR, it's in its inactive state, either that can actually be linked with the inactive G protein, i.e. the G protein with its alpha subunit bonded to GDP, or the uh, inactive G protein can be uh, attached to the intracellular aspect of the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so remember the phospholipid bi there has two layers of phospholipids that are, uh, you know, that um, with, the, with each of their hydrophobic tails facing each other and the polar heads facing either the intracellular compartment or the extracellular compartment. So um, what it means for this G protein to be bound to the intracellular aspect is that it's bound somewhere like here, basically. Okay, so when a ligand binds to this GPCR, so for instance, when acetylcholine binds to this M1 receptor, what's going to happen is that the uh, GPCR is going to become catalytically active. And what it's going to do is it's going to make an active enzyme which can then catalyze the breaking of this bond here between the GDP molecule and the alpha-Q um, subunit of this G protein. 
um, and it's going to take a GTP molecule from the cytoplasm and it's going to bind it instead to that alpha Q subunit. So what you'll end up with basically is your alpha Q subunit here, so this is alpha Q bonded to GTP. And when you do that, the alpha Q subunit no longer wants to be bound with the beta and the gamma subunits. So the beta and the gamma subunits remain bound to each other. They have, still have each other, uh, but they no longer are bound to the alpha subunit. So the heterotrimeric G protein has split into two portions. Okay, uh, now what happens is that this alpha Q subunit goes and activates an enzyme, which is in uh, the cell membrane. Okay, and this enzyme is called phospholipase C, often denoted PLC, so phospholipase C. Okay, and when alpha-Q-GTP activates this enzyme, it becomes catalytically active. And the enzyme which, the, sorry, the reaction which it catalyzes is the breakdown of a molecule that's often abbreviated to PIP2. Um, and PIP2 is basically a large molecule that is found in the phospholipid by there. So it's got a structure very similar to a phospholipid. So let's go over what the structure of PIP2 is. Okay, so PIP2. And basically what PIP2 stands for is it stands for phosphatidyl inositol, phosphatidyl inositol, um, inositol, like that, 4,5-bisphosphate. Uh, right, okay, so the P there stands for phosphatidyl, the I stands for inositol, and this P2 stands for bisphosphate, basically. Okay, uh, so let's go over what the structure of this molecule is. So phosphatidyl is basically the structure of a normal phospholipid. So you have the glycerol molecule, which is this free carbon molecule with free hydroxyl groups. And what two of them are bonded to um, uh, long-chain fatty acids. So I'll just put those here. So they are ester-linked to long-chain fatty acids. Okay. So two of the hydroxyl groups on this glycerol molecule are ester-linked to these uh, long-chain fatty acids here, where these R and R' prime groups could be anything. So um, let me just split this up into different portions. This is a long-chain fatty acid here, and this also is a long-chain fatty acid. So those are both long-chain uh, carboxylic acids or free fatty acids. So I'll put, f well, they're not free anymore, but they're fatty acids. Uh, or uh, their proper name is long-chain carboxylic acids. Right, so uh, both of those uh, have been esterified to the hydroxyl groups on a glycerol molecule. So here is your glycerol molecule here. So the final hydroxyl group is bonded to something different, but that basically is your glycerol molecule. So I'll circle that in a different colour too. glycerol here. Okay, right. So when you bonded um, two free fatty acids to your glycerol molecule, like so, what you have so far is called a diacyl glyceride, because you've got two acyl groups, uh, which is the name given to this uh, carbonyl with a, a hydrocarbon back there. That's called an acyl group. Two acyl groups bonded to your glycerol, so a diacyl glyceride. Okay, now, uh, if it was just a diacyl glyceride, what you'd have is off this oxygen, you'd have another hydrogen here, basically. But instead, we are, have got a phosphatidyl group, basically. And phosphatidyl basically means that you have an extra phosphate group bound in here. So this is what turns it into the phosphatidyl portion. This is a phosphate group here. Okay, so um, this is your phosphate group, and that turns this entire molecule from being a diacyl glycerol into being a phosphatidyl group. A phosphatidyl group. Okay, and basically, uh, most of the phospholipids in the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane have this structure. They have a glycerol molecule bound to two free fatty, uh, well, two fatty acids or long-chain carboxylic acids up here, and they have a phosphate group bound to the final hydroxyl group there. Now, if we're going to bind phosphatidyl to inositol, 
what we're going to do is we're going to stick an inositol molecule on here. Now, inositol is a six-membered uh, carbon ring, basically. So, six-membered carbon ring. And basically, every single carbon atom has a hydroxyl group coming off it. So, stick on the hydroxyl groups here. Okay. And the hydroxyl of the fourth and the fifth carbon are going to be involved in something else because it's phosphatidylinositol 4, 5 bisphosphate. So I won't draw their hydrogens um, on the hydroxyl groups. And now to saturate this, because at the moment all these carbons only have three bonds, you just stick loads of hydrogens on basically. Okay, so that molecule that we've seen there, that's inositol. So um, let me circle that in another colour. We'll have this one blue. So this is inositol. There, so so far we've got phosphatidyl inositol. Uh, so we've made most of this now. We've made phosphatidyl inositol. And now we've just got four, five bisphosphates. We just need to add phosphate groups onto the fourth and the fifth carbon. Okay, so here we go. Phosphate group on here. O minus and a hydroxyl group. And then a phosphate group on here. Phosphate, double bond to oxygen, OH, O minus. Okay, so there we have our two phosphate groups, and I'll circle those phosphate groups in green to stick to earlier uh, convention up there. And that molecule now is phosphatidyl in ositol 4 5 bisphosphate, or PIP2 for short. PIP2. Right, so what is phospholipase C going to do to this molecule? Well, actually, firstly, let me just tell you, this molecule uh, sits in the cell membrane, just like a normal phospholipid. So I've told you that if this was a normal phospholipid, what you'd have is just these two long-chain carboxylic acids here, a glycerol molecule, and then this phosphate. That basically is the structure of a normal phospholipid. And basically, if I draw a bit of the phospholipid by there here, when you draw the phospholipids as the, this circle with two uh, lines down like that, that's often a, uh, a way of uh, that's often a uh, cartoon way of drawing phospholipids. Basically, these two lines going down, they represent these uh, long chain carboxylic acid, basically, carboxylic acids, and they face inwards towards the membrane. Then this head here represents the glycerol molecule and the um, phosphate group here, which face out towards uh, the cytoplasm or out towards the extracellular space in the case of these, um, these phospholipids up here. Okay, uh, so uh, in the case of PIP2, basically it's just like this. The long-chain carboxylic acids are going to stick in towards um, the center of the phospholipid by there, so they're going to stick in like that. Then the glycerol is going to come out like here. Then you're going to have this phosphate group, this green group here. And then you'll have your inositol with its two phosphates off the side, like that. Okay, uh, so that's basically how PIP2 sits within the membrane, or the phospholipid by there. Okay, so phospholipase C, this enzyme that we have activated uh, with our alpha QGTP molecule, is going to... Uh, break down this uh, uh, PIP2 molecules, uh, well, these PIP2 molecules that are in the cell membrane. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.